So working in the government uh, in my previous life as a web developer for the United States Coast Guard, we had to be very concerned with accessibility uh, because we fell under, we had to comply with Section 508 uh, rules, which were uh, under the Americans with, with Disabilities Act. In other words, our applications had to be accessible to everyone. That included blind users. So we would add for our images, wherever we had an image, we would add an alt tag or a, and a maybe title tags so that blind users, their screen readers, would hit the image and would read to them what the content of that image is. Similarly, we had to um, be careful when using color coding for messages. So for example, if we use the color red to display an error message, we also had to put an image next to the error message, such as maybe a red X, or make sure that the error message said the word error in front of it. Similarly, with a green message, maybe it was a green success message, we had to put the word success in there. We couldn't rely on colors to communicate things only because colorblind users wouldn't find that accessible. Uh, working for the working for a uh, nonprofit, uh, I worked with a marketing person, and this individual brought to my attention issues like color contrast, which I had never thought about. Um, our images, our text, had to have a sufficient color contrast with the with the background. So, like this is somewhat legible. This is not so much le legible, um, uh, or it could even get worse. Uh, we could have a white, white text and a white background, completely illegible. So we had to be aware of the color contrast because, as uh, for some many users, it's uh, it's difficult to distinguish the text. Similarly, we also had to be careful to use uh, the font sizes that would scale so that users could use their screen readers to change the font sizes and image sizes to. Uh, they were uh, had, had poor eyesight or maybe needed reading glasses. These are the kinds of things we had to take into account, and and anyone working with an interface needs to take into account the fact that not everyone is going to experience your application the way you do. Here's an interesting example of accessibility in video games. Um, did you know that blind? users play racing games and sports games. Uh, game developer Electronic Arts discovered that they had a great deal of um, blind users who were playing racing games. And the way they were able to do it is they would listen to the stereo sound of the, of the, of the cars racing, memorize the tracks, and by feeling the vibrations in the controller, they knew where they were in the track. And similarly, they could also, by feeling the vibrations in the controller and by listening to the play-by-play -play of the, the announcers in sports games, they're able to play games like football or hockey or soccer, even though they can't see the action on the screen. So thinking about interfaces, I was realized I had a relatable game for myself as, a, as someone who has good eyesight, someone who has no issues with their hearing. I thought about the game Dungeons and Dragons Computer Labyrinth game built, made in, uh, released in 1980. Uh, you can see it's from KB Toys. It was 50 bucks, knocked down to 20 bucks. Well-worn box here. I found I got this used online. You got the family members playing and enjoying it, which gives you just enough background to appreciate the Portal uh, cake acquisition game, uncooperative cake acquisition game, which has like the worn sides and this just delightful picture of the play testers with the observers in the background. But enough of that digression. Let's talk about Dungeons and Dragons Computer Labyrinth game. So this is the Dungeons and Dragons Computer Labyrinth game. Um, it's very interesting from a UI perspective, uh, user interface perspective. It is entirely sound-based. You've got a board game here, but there's sounds that tell you what's going on in the game. And uh, you would not 
know what on earth is going on in this game without the instruction book. And one day I'd like to do a video on old computer games and how they all required instruction books. And the game uses sound to tell you what's going on in the game. So, for example, um, in this game, I should start with the, there's the three rules of, there's the three steps to introducing a board game. What is this game? In this game, we are adventurers and we're going to adventure through a dungeon and explore to try and find the treasure. The treasure is guarded by a dragon and the dragon is going to chase us around and eat us if we aren't care careful. So this is the dungeon and as we explore the dungeon, the game is going to use sounds to tell you how things uh, are working, how what's what's going on in the game, what the events are. So example, let's let, if you bump into a wall, that's a wall, or if we bump into a door, what happens if the dragon wakes up? We're going to hear dragon wakes up, dragon wakes up. Dragon wakes is a low buzzing. Dragon attacks is six notes in in repeating high-low pattern. Dragon flying is a series of siren-like rising and falling notes. What happens if we find the treasure? The treasure is a short version of the winner's tune. And what does the winner sound like? And finally, a slow falling tune means that the player is out of the game. <clears throat> so how do you know what's going on in this game? If all you have is sounds, well, you have to follow the all algorithm inside the rulebook. Uh, the rulebook tells you how to play. So following the rules in the rulebook, to set up a game, we're going to turn on the game. We're going to set our home base and then we're going to hit next turn and next turn again. All right, so our player is on the home base and then in order to move, we push it, we feel our way around ah, and there we, we have found a wall and so we can put a wall in there. A very a more advanced version of this game, you would leave the walls off and try to memorize your way through the dungeon. So let's try a quick playthrough here. Found another wall. <gasps> We've woken the dragon. So, we know that we're near the treasure. So what we can do is we can put the treasure in here. We know the treasure is in this area. That sound means the dragon is moving. So, let's put the dragon on the board. We don't know exactly where the dragon is. Every time we hit the wall, we know the dragon moves. Another wall. That dragon... Ah! The dragon has hit us! So that means we go back to here. So the dragon hit us here, so we know the dragon is here. I did not know there was a wall there. So we know the dragon is probably here or here. Ugh, oh, we are so dead. What I'm doing right now is I'm feeling out my way through the dungeon to try and get an idea of where the walls are. Because when we find the dragon, we don't want to get caught into any dead ends. So we're feeling our way through. The dragon has woken up. Take three.
take four. Take six. Not even using the piece anymore. Take number I don't know. I'm gonna do this. I've beaten this game many times. I got the treasure. I got the treasure. I just have to get back home now. Can I get back home? Ah! It's okay. Got the treasure. Whoops. <sighs> and uh, yes, it's that easy to, to beat the game. Playing here these many sessions, um, trying to beat the game for this video, I realized I stopped using the little, the little character. And a little note, you can play two players where both players pick a home base and start wandering around and you can, you can get the dragon to go after the other player. Um, I have played that version. It's kind of nice. But an interesting UI per, uh, perspective here is I stopped using the little player and I started just punching my little finger along. And what made it very easy to do that in this game is that there's little pictures here. Here's a picture of a little ranger, a knight, uh, a kind of demon looking monster, a princess, uh, a pair, some tools, a rat. And these pictures uh, I found made it very easy for me to remember where I was on the board. I'm like, oh yeah, I was at the princess. Similarly, if you're playing this in hard mode, you don't put these walls down. You have you try to memorize where everything is. I can't imagine what that's like, even though I can sort of do that. I'm getting better at doing that in chess now, memorizing where the pieces are. The knowing where you woke up the dragon, being able to put this piece down, knowing where you woke up the dragon and getting this little treasure piece, you can put that down to say, you know, you're near when the dragon wakes up, you know, you're near the treasure. Similarly, the dragon is hard to track at first because you kind of don't know where it is. But once it hits you, you know where that dragon is. And you can and if you know the algorithm for how the dragon moves, the dragon is going to take the most direct path to where you are that it can find. You can approximate where the dragon is. Strategy wise, I find it's very important to feel your way around as much of the dungeon as possible. You can see here is where the dragon and the treasure is. I haven't, I didn't map that out very much because you wake up the dragon and then it becomes, you begin running for your life. But you can see here, I mapped out everything really well. That way I knew when I got the treasure here, I knew if I could get to here, it was just a home stretch, just a little, just easy ride to get back to home base with my treasure. So I brought this game out just to show you that not to be constrained by your UI. Don't make assumptions about your UI. No one would make a game like this today because it is so constrained, because it is so hard to understand. But I hope you could see that it's actually also a lot of fun and a very challenging game. If you do have eyesight and if you break out of your reliance on your visual senses and you think about your audio senses, your tactile senses and rumble pads and thinking about the different senses and taking advantage of them, you can create some really interesting experiences. You can also create richer experiences for everyone. Um, if even people who have all their senses, they being able being mindful of audit, auditory and tactile feedback, those kinds of things can really enrich your development.